Welcome to Thriller Bitcoin. Welcome to Thriller Bitcoin. But most importantly, the, the top of mind question is, will nuclear lead to Godzilla? <laughs> <laughs> well, that is the challenge that um, the entire nuclear industry is focused on right now to make sure that we do not create another Godzilla. I, I never understood that. Just real quick. I like, I never understood, like, how did they, what did they, like, what, how did that happen? They, they like, threw a bomb, you know, off the coast of wherever, and then it, Godzilla was a lizard or something like, like I never understood. Did you ever watch any of that stuff? I, did, I didn't. <laughs> I've seen all the clips afterwards and all just the ridiculousness. Yeah. It's really funny, but uh, it, make, it makes me think of like, of Fukushima and like, why didn't, why didn't Godzilla make a comeback after the Fukushima disaster in Japan? Yeah. <laughs> why, 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 do, why do you think, do you think there's, and this can probably lead us to the, the, the main issue around nuclear. And when we think about it, like on, like on a social layer, right? Like, why do you think there is this, all this propaganda around nuclear uh, and, and, and uh, just the, I mean, we saw uh, Oppenheimer get released and that scared the crap out of people, I'm sure. Um, and then now you're seeing like all these Godzilla movies, these King Kong movies. There's even an Apple TV, like, I don't know if you saw that. Uh, there's like this new launch thing about around, yeah, like the first hour or the first episode is literally about, it's with Kurt Russell, but it's literally about like this whole nuclear um, thing around, uh, you know, uh, in the, in the fifties or whatever. But, uh, why do you think that is? Well, so I'm going to change topics, but come back real quick. I just read, read a uh, marketing study that was put out by the potential energy coalition. Mm -hmm. I learned about it. Uh, it was on a podcast that was put out by the nuclear energy Indi Institute as 50 pages. Uh, they surveyed like over 13,000 people across multiple countries and, uh, they had some really cool takeaways, and one of the biggest takeaways is the younger generation has almost no opposition to nuclear. So they are completely for it to be able to solve the world's energy challenges. So if there are people in the older generation that are stalwarts that absolutely think that nuclear should not happen, and they are also heavily influenced or heavy influencers in Hollywood, uh, then yeah. they probably do everything they can to influence this new generation to to adopt the same fear that the previous generation had. Is there, is there any country in the world that, that already relies on nuclear um, entirely? I don't know entirely, but I know J Japan obviously was heavily, uh, heavily reliant on, on nuclear. Um, they've actually pulled back quite a bit, uh, shut down a lot of the reactors since the Fukushima disaster, but, uh, but that is coming back around, uh, just like Germany, uh, it's been in the news more so in the past couple of years of, uh, decommissioning their nuclear reactors. And that's coming back around to Hanum to where I've heard that they're even burning trees to be able to create energy. What the hell? <laughs> so oh let's, my God. let's just dial it back a I couple mean, hundred cause, years. Cause if you think about it, there's like these nuggets in the ground, right? Like with coal and, yeah. and everything, like. You would think they would just use. I'm, I'm sure I, I'm I'm not a, no expert in any of this stuff. So a lot of the, a lot of what I know is just stuff I read online. And and so like what, my understanding is like 
we've sufficiently gotten better with uh, some of the refinements around uh, coal and some of these other types of, uh, you know, Earth's natural resources that we use for energy. Is that necessarily true? Is that? Uh, yes and no. I mean, when it comes to coal, when you burn coal, it's still very, it, it releases a lot of pollution in the air. Um, there's a lot of deaths that are related to and calculated based on uh, the number of terawatt hours that have been put out uh, in the different industries. There's a great study. I can't remember who, I, who it was that put it out, but I read it recently and posted about it. Um, but it basically coal is the largest um, number of deaths per terawatt hour produced. And the biggest majority of those deaths is actually related to the pollution that's emitted in the air and people dying from lung diseases and things like that in small ridden cities. Mm -hmm. So there's still a big challenge with coal. Has it gotten better? Yes. They capture some of the emissions and bring them back in. I don't know the details of how they do that, but there are ways that they improve it. But when it comes to, there's so many other cleaner sources to be able to generate heat and generate power. Um, and oil is a great, uh, obviously fossil fuels are a huge um, producer of power generation across the world. We rely on them every day. Um, old crude oil, uh, many islands, many um, many remote places still rely on things like fuel oil and propane. They have to pull them in, burn them, and, and convert them to uh, electricity by boiling water or use something that's called cogeneration. And then obviously natural gas is byproduct of drilling for oil or you can, um, when you drill an oil well, you get three, three main things, crude oil, you get natural gas and you get produced water and you got to do something with all three of them. And the natural gas is the cleanest way to be able to convert those fossil fuels into heat that can turn into electricity. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about that real quick before we jump into the nuclear, because I, I feel like we have to fully explain like what, what we're dealing with here. And you're primarily looking at, um, um, some like let's yeah let's talk about like texas in general right like mm -hmm. big oil natural gas state um you know i've always talked about on the pod but like my my brother works in the natural gas um, um industry in mm -hmm. south texas so like how does how does that work for for the people at home who are getting electricity either from you know you know, here in Austin, San Antonio, or even like in South Texas or Dallas or Houston, like how, how does all that work together as far as like a functioning um, resource machine for, for energy? So how does it work? Uh, let me clarify like the how, question. How, yeah. How does it get to your home from, uh, yeah. Uh, so when you drill an oil well, like I said, it produces, well, let's say, let's simplify it. Let's say it's an, just a gas well. So there's no oil involved in the, in the uh, reservoir and you get gas and you get water. Um, the water is typically a salt water and then you have to do something with that. So there's a disposal cost, but the gas then comes through or comes out. Uh, it's usually not clean, completely clean when you can bring it out of the ground. So you go through a gas processing plant, which takes things out of it that will be toxic. Like uh, there's things called an amine treater, um, different, different technologies to be able to take different molecules out of it to make sure that it's very close to pure methane. And then it also separates other molecules that are in the natural gas stream like butane, propane, things like that, and turn around and sell those byproducts as well. But you go past that gas processing and then you have a clean, mostly methane natural gas stream. Uh, they typically then inject it directly into a pipeline and do one of two things. They either inject it directly into a pipeline and to transport it somewhere to be able to sold in the market and be used either to burn in your house, in your stove, in your oven, your hot water heater, your uh, your heater for your home, your HVAC system, or um, they can eat, they can use it right there on site in what's called a cogeneration plant or a natural gas power power plant. Um, and these typically use a couple different forms to be able to generate um, electricity. They the most efficient way is using both both ways. First is just boiling water, and that turns a steam turbine, turns, it'll, turns a generator, converts it into electricity. And if I remember the numbers correctly, it's about 30% efficiency if you just do that. So if you make one BTU of heat, you get 0.3 B, uh, you know, only 30% of that gets converted into electricity. So not super efficient. So the way that they make it more efficient is they combine it with uh, basically a jet engine 
Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. It's uh, so they call it a a, a gas um, a gas turbine. Uh, gas, not meaning as in gasoline or jet fuel going into it, but it's because it's using a gas as the fluid to be able to conf- to cause the rotation. Um, so it's a turbine, and it's basically the same thing as a jet engine. Um, so jet engine, what you do is you bring air in, and then air when the air comes in, it gets pressurized and it gets heated up. And when it does that, it causes the en- uh, it ca- they then release it into a less pressurized ca- cabin, and then they inject jet fuel into it and burn it, and to make it heat up really fast to make the turbine turn, and that produces the energy, uh, produces the electricity. So they do the same thing with natural gas in a natural gas facility, and they combine both of those processes between that and a steam um, a steam turbine to be able to get it up to about 50, a little over 50% efficiency. So they convert a little over half of the heat produced from natural gas into directly into electricity. Yeah. So I remember during the winter storm, you remember the winter storm in 2021? Yeah, Yuri. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it was interesting because the the houses that had natural gas piped in um, were still running, were mm-hmm. still up and running as far as like the refrigerator, their stove, their ovens. And, and uh, I, I kind of saw that kind of play out. So, I mean, in my head, I'm always thinking like, okay, it's good to have a, it's good to have a, <laughs> a gas line and this like electricity line as a backup. So we have a uh, gas fireplace and that's like the only gas appliance that we have. In, uh, I think we and have, and we it never turns off or did, did, did it turn off during the winter? Storm? Oh, so not the HVAC system, though, mm-hmm. or I'm sorry, the, HV, the HVAC system, it requires both electricity and gas. So it wasn't, mm-hmm. it wasn't working because electricity was out, but we have a fireplace that you can just open the valve and, yeah. and light the flame. And so we were all, all four of us huddled in the living room with like all of our heavy camping gear, mummy bags and everything else. And we were huddled up next to this little <laughs> gas fireplace <laughs> trying to keep warm. <laughs> Gosh. Well, I mean, yeah. And then I know you can, re- you can like retrofit certain other, like other uh, machinery that can, convert that that gas line into electricity right or absolutely yeah. yeah so that's that's kind of cool about gas okay but we're not here to talk about gas <laughs> but it's good to get a good breakdown of like what what we're sitting on as far as like texas and, and, and you yeah. know all that kind of thing so um so nuclear right mm-hmm. how is this better because gas sounds really nice man <laughs> like <laughs> You know, maybe it was just me like grow, growing up around refineries and, and corpus and like seeing you know, my mom, we used to drive by like, uh, like, you know, they have a freeway and like on the freeway, when you leave town, there's all these refineries. So when I was a kid, my mom would lie to us and she'd be like, oh, this is where they make all the cookies. This is the cookie factory. Cause it would like, I would have like smoke and all these lights at night. I'd be like, this is where they make Oreos, Chips Ahoy, Nabisco. Like I, like we really believed that for a really long time until my older brother like spoiled it for us. So what I'm trying to say is like, I have a fondness for refineries. So how is like, when, when we look at, when we look at like, you know, nuclear, I mean, you, you see the thing that pops in my mind is like Homer Simpson, right? With, with the Gosh, whole thing. The three-eyed fish. Yeah. yeah. So like, let's talk about nuclear now. What, what is, um, what, what are, what are, what would that process look like for the average American household, you know, um, and, and how is that energy uh, deployed out from its, yeah. its, its origin? So, uh, so I guess maybe one last step in the, in the gas uh, conversation that gener- that electricity gets generated there on that cogeneration plant, and then it has to be distributed to your house. And so that's what we call the grid. Um, so you have all these different wires uh, across the U.S. That, that distributes the electricity directly to your home. Well, it's, it's no different with nuclear. Mm-hmm. Um, nuclear, you can have a centralized location, a centralized plant, and that's traditionally been the case. Um, most of the plants that are out there today are around 800 megawatts or one giga to one gigawatt of energy production mm-hmm. per site. And so they would be located in one location and then the power is generated from there and then di- distributed to the house. So that's the distribution channel. But then your other question, or I guess the other part of your question is yeah. how does the actual electricity be generated uh, from, from nuclear? Yeah. So. Like how does it make its way to the, um, I'm sure it's like an easy answer, but. Well, yes and no. Now there's some, ch- there's some big changes though. So there's old nuclear, the, the nuclear technology that's, that's in production today and it's been around since the 1950s and 60s. Um, they call them light water reactors. 
Is that is that the one with the rods? Because what mm-hmm. I learned in like, uh, I don't know if it was uh, yes. behavioral science or forget which science it was. Behavioral science. <laughs> Maybe not behavioral <laughs> science. It was, uh, but they, they talked about this three rod approach or whatever. And I remember thinking this is so boring. So tell me this, <laughs> <laughs> tell me how this, how, tell me, is that the old way or is this like the new way? How does this work? Yeah, so the, the rods, yes, it's a solid fuel. So they pack the uranium into a rod. Mm-hmm. all of the uranium into a single rod, and then they also have what they call control rods. Mm-hmm. So you have a, a uranium rod that's causing a, a nuclear fission, causes mm-hmm. a chain reaction. Um, the way that happens is that a neutron will be released from one of the molecules, and it can split the atoms of another uranium, re, uranium atom, and that releases a whole bunch of heat when that happens. Okay. Um, and that the control rods are put into place to be able to absorb those neutrons to slow down or stop the reaction. So there's, there's the actual nuclear rod and then there's the control rod. Um, So that all happens in basically a water bath. So water then absorbs the heat that's caused by the chain reaction. Steam, right? Yep. Steam will get generated into a steam turbine. Now it's all, now they actually don't, one of the problems with light water reactors is they want to not generate very much steam. They want to control that. So they have it very pressurized so that the heat temperature can go up much higher than normal 212 degrees of boiling water in Fahrenheit. Uh, So what happens, they pressurize it so they keep it controlled, but then they move the water through a cycle and it does turn, it does turn to steam and turns the turbine. Uh, All, what all of this causes is a, is a, problem which is or a challenge which is what led to the um chernobyl disaster right is having a uh, you're basically operating a giant uh pressure cooker because you have uh, an intense pressure if you have high pressure and something goes a something that what's supposed to contain that pressure gets malfunctions malfunctions <laughs> it you just get goes pop kaboom yeah <laughs> i mean we see you see those those rice cookers right like yeah. in uh, on youtube yeah um yeah yeah and we, we had the unfortunate uh circumstance with the the boston marathon a few years back where they they figured mm. those guys figured that out and, and turned it into a terror incident but gosh but yeah i mean that you can see that's what a light water reactor basically is. Now there are tons of safety mechanisms in place and because of the disasters like Chernobyl, like Three three Mile Island and like Fukushima, the only three major disasters that have happened in the history of nuclear, they've learned from a lot of those things and made a lot of changes. But still in essence, the original plan design that's still working today is you generate heat from fission, you boil water, you turn a steam engine and generates electricity. That's the basic concept. Mm -hmm. There's different variations on that of the, you know, I think it's almost 500 different reactors across the, uh, across the world. Um, But now that's old nuclear. Now let's talk about new nuclear. New nuclear is completely rewriting the script. Um, It is using, there's multiple different technologies that are being advanced. Some of these designs were actually, they came up with them in the sixties. Uh, so they've been around for a very long time, and that's a, that's probably a whole other uh, angle to the story that we probably want to dive into. But before we get there, uh, new nuclear one there's they call them generation four reactors or advanced reactor technologies, and they're exploring multiple different designs. There are designs where there's gases that are cooling it, that there's they're actually turning uh, salt into liquid, so they're molten salt reactors, which is in my opinion, the the best design moving forward. But there's there's six or seven, eight different designs. And they're they're all utilizing the rods. Is, is that yeah. I, no? They're not. Well, no. Um, so and there a lot of the models are actually go, going to what's called a trizo fuel, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, T R I S O. Um, they take nuclear pellets and they are surrounded by a core instead, uh, or surrounded by a uh, solid. Uh, moderator, that's a whole nother technical term. Gets a, it gets a little too technical, but but it, they're pellets and they can actually float through the system. So that's uh, a common design now that's still using solid fuel, but then the molten salt reactors take that design to a, com- 
and flip it completely on its head, and they, it's all a liquid. So they actually heat these things up to 700 degrees Celsius. Um, that's their main operating temperature. And, and to give... <laughs> I mean, for me, it's hard to imagine what, how hot is 700 degrees Celsius? <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. That's so the reason why they're called hot. molten salt reactors, it's, it's the same temperature. It's molten lava. So Gosh. lava can be anywhere from 700 to 1200 degrees Celsius. So yeah. th these, the same, uh, same for these salts that they, they get turned into a liquid. It's about the same temperature range, about 700 to 12, 13, 1400 before it turns into a gas. Um, and so what happens is they heat these things up that hot and then they actually dissolve the reamp. So now this is salt. And if you can imagine the salt that's on your table and mm -hmm. turning it into a liquid mm -hmm. and then just like water and you can right now, you know, you can dissolve a solid salt into water when you boil it mm -hmm. or when you heat it up. Well, you can do the same thing with uranium. You can s dissolve it into the salt, but the salt is the liquid. And because it has such a high, high boiling point, over 12, 1300 degrees Celsius, you have a huge temperature range to be able to utilize that heat and it keeps it more safe, which means coming back to the pressure cooker that you can operate these things at atmospheric pressure, which means it's the same pressure outside in the atmosphere as it is inside the reactor, which means it's impossible for an explosion. So that's one way that these things are, these new nuclear technologies are revolutionizing the safety. of nuclear. That's interesting. So, so just real quick, so the waste, because that's another thing, right? Is mm -hmm. the waste when it comes to it. Does this, um, the, 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 the thing that we were, the waste before, where is that coming from? Is that, is that coming directly from the rods or is that coming directly from the, the, the water or the uh, liquids? It is coming directly from the rods. So what happens is you the those rods can only be used for about a year and a half to two years. Mm -hmm. And then it's called spent fuel. All that means is the concentration of uranium in the correct isotope is too low to be able to use for a sustainable reaction. Mm -hmm. and Or the concentration of plutonium has increased, and so they have to pull it out and then put new fuel rods in, but they have to do something with those fuel rods that are still sitting there and they're, they are toxic. Well, I wouldn't use the word toxic. <laughs> <laughs> but, what would you use? Well, they are, they're given off radiation. They are, they oh, okay. are still react reactive. So mm -hmm. they cool them down in a water bath for mm -hmm. I believe about two years. And then they put, then they put them in a, uh, um, a, basically a, you know, you see the, uh, the, the barrels that are that are cemented and, and mm -hmm. they put them in and they store them right there on site and that's the that's your toxic waste. Mm -hmm. But to to really visualize for people to understand how much waste that nuclear power currently generates. Now this is with old nuclear technology, not new new, new nuclear. Is if you took all of the energy that you generated in your entire lifetime and you powered it all with nuclear the amount of waste that you would generate from all that mm -hmm. power is in a single soda can like that Coke that you got there. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's not a lot. Yeah. It's not much. Imagine that with coal. It's huge. Like you're talking about landfills. Yeah. That's fascinating. Yep. So these days we're using pellets. So it, I, I'm imagining the same thing what they go bad or they don't go bad or they, they lose their, uh, they're, they're still using rods. So current technology that's operating is, is still rods, but they are advancing technologies that are using pellets. So they're testing them. They're getting designs, uh, approved to be able to build reactors to test them to make sure that they're safe and operable. Yeah. So, so let's talk about that. Let's, let's, um, let's talk about what you're trying to do with the uh, line shield and, and, and how this intersects with Bitcoin. Cause I, I don't see it, to be honest. I, I, there was a guy, gosh, I want to say it was like 2021. I'm not sure if he still lives in Austin anymore, but he was coming around these parts. He was coming around these parts talking about nuclear and, and like Bitcoin. And uh, he came to Plub Lab like, uh, I want to say, I'd say it was 2021. And it was like, uh, forget his name. I don't remember his name. Um, 
I still see him around town, uh, not around town, but around conferences sometime. Like, oh, there's that guy talking about nuclear two years ago. I'm not sure what ever happened with that. But um, w- what's it like these days, two years? Because this is the second time, you know, I've, I've seen this in, in, in the Bitcoin space where somebody's talking about nuclear and Bitcoin. Uh, it's not my first, first time seeing it. So how is this different from 18, 24 months ago or 36 months ago the last time I heard it? Well, I, I think to be able to answer that question, I have to go back. Why? Why did I dive into nuclear? Uh, because I came to nuclear from Bitcoin mining. Uh, so getting into Bitcoin mining, if anybody that's been involved in Bitcoin mining for any significant amount of time has either gotten wrecked or heard stories of other people getting wrecked, mm-hmm. it's an extremely volatile, difficult industry. And man, I, I was wrecked. <laughs> just with the, <laughs> as many miners couple. that you deployed yeah, or what? Yeah. 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 You were just underneath. Um, yeah. I mean, this last cycle, this last bear market has been brutal. You weren't um, doing the compass stuff, were you? Because I know a lot of people I, uh, lost big on the compass stuff. So the, the the compass story of the miners that were in Russia that got confiscated by Russia, I was not part of that. But oh, that's good. Did I have miners at compass? Some of my miners were at compass and yes, I got <sighs> rug pulled. Everybody got rugged on that one. Um, it was not Golly. as bad as the Russian one. I ended up coming out a little bit better on the deal, uh, that part. God, and I damn. got my miners and hosted them locally, Dude. maintained them myself. To just, just let's yeah. just talk about that for a second because that was I remember that being such a big thing. It's kind of like and, and keys, was it twenty twenty one, twenty twenty two? It was something, dude. It was Compass was promoted everywhere on every podcast, and uh, I remember thinking like, oh wow, they they sound legitimate. They sound uh, like they're they're doing everything right, and and like uh, I remember being around people who would talk about these Compass and great conversations around it and how. High, high, high uh, quality people they were and stuff like this. Turns out, completely got rugged. All those people completely got rugged. Learned the hard way. You know, a lot of people, you know, you know, didn't see this coming, right? Because you typically don't see this coming, um, right? So, what I'm trying to say is, like, yeah, how, how bad was it with the whole compass thing? And uh, is that why you moved over to nuclear? Like, what, what, what was it? Uh how bad was it? Let's start, let's start there. Uh, it was rough. Like, I mean, if you imagine uh, these bull runs, every single bull run, we have an immense amount of leverage that comes into the, into the market. So you see exchanges that allow 10 X hundred X leverage to that you're borrowing other people's money to buy Bitcoin. And it just, it's crazy. And so we get over pumped. Well, the same basically mentality, I think went into compass that, do I know anybody on in the inside of this company? No, but I, I'm just observing it. It looks like a similar mentality, similar culture as some of these exchanges and just growing as fast as possible. And if you want to be more philosophical about it, it's, it's pervasive in most of our um, fiat culture is growth at all costs, right? Yeah. And revenue is the ultimate. Um, and so what they did is they ramped, I watched them ramp up ridiculously fast and just added more and more sites. And what they were doing is they were just kind of a middleman that was the front end website. And then they would connect you to other hosting sites that, and they would just be the middleman that that managed the relationship between the individual pleb miner that needed to co-host their miners. And then the large massive sites and sometimes. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. They, wow. they did not own, or as far as I know, they didn't own or operate their own sites. They were just a middleman. Um, but they had such a large marketing presence. And mm-hmm. from what I understand, Whit, Whit Gibbs, the, the CEO, that's one of his major skill sets was the marketing side of things. Mm-hmm. Um, so they had this massive presence, which gives them the appearance at least of a massive mm-hmm. organization. But when you actually started working with them, there was a lot of... Um, I noticed a lot of dysfunction right away and just the, it's not even dysfunction. It's lack, it's lack of organization. There was disorganization, um, just not being able to keep up with tracking receipts and timing and, and the accounting part of things. And so I was, it wasn't a huge surprise to me when bigger things fell apart as they grew massively. Yeah. It's one of those things, right? Like 
you know, being a founder, you, you have to take the time to get, get your house in order. Right. Um, and, and especially during a bull market, it's going so fast and you really don't really get a chance to, you know, sit still for a second until you get to the bear market. And then you, that's when you should start doing a lot of this cleanup. If you haven't done it already, if you weren't doing it. Um, um, so yeah, it, it, it seems like maybe that's, Bear markets something. are for builders, right? Yeah. You got to build a strong foundation. If you don't build that strong foundation right now during the bear market, when the bull market comes, you're not going to be ready. Exactly. No, it's good advice. Um, yeah, so that, that was interesting with the Compass stuff. So let's get back to nuclear. I don't know why we keep, <laughs> we keep segueing. <laughs> okay, so but this is good. I mean, it's, it's good fun. quality. It's a good quality conversation because it just kind of, sh it kind of shows you just how many times the rug's been pulled, uh, you know, underneath, you know, from the plebs, you know, f yeah. uh, in regards to this kind of stuff. And even some of the more, more prominent people in this space um, got, got rugged too as well, right? They didn't even see it coming. So it's, it just shows that, you know. Yeah, but mine was my own fault. Yeah. I can't, I can't blame anybody else. So yeah. I knew the fiat culture. I knew the risks I, and I still took on debt. Yeah. To be able to ramp up quick. I, I got into the same fiat mindset and I got wrecked. My, my own problem on the way down. And so I saw it coming though. And I realized through this process of like, man, the only way in the long run that Bitcoin miners will stay alive mm -hmm. as a company will be to secure inexpensive, stable, reliable, flexible power generation. Mm -hmm. And so at the time, the new hotness, the thing that everybody was going after was securing natural gas and going out on an actual oil well, somebody that was doing flare gas or they had um, stranded gas somewhere that they couldn't actually get the gas to market and they would find these oil producers and try to convince them of the legitimacy of bringing a container full of Bitcoin miners, something that they've never, these oil and gas producers had never even heard of before taking your, buying your natural gas, converting it to electricity, and then using it right there on site. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, a lot of oil and gas producers are very skeptical of this because they don't understand a lot of the underlying principles of what's going on. And plus, they see the volatility of the Bitcoin market, and they say, well, are these guys really going to be around, you know, for the long haul? Um, so rightfully so. But I saw everybody doing that. And, and I knew that it was a good model, but I knew that, I wasn't in a place to compete with people that are already well capitalized right. in that market. So I thought, how do I get five years ahead of these people? How do I find a better, more reliable power source to be able to secure for a long term to make sure that the company's stable for the long term? And I explored other alternative energies, um, not just nuclear, but after a few iterations of different opportunities that I had, I came upon nuclear and then I came more specifically on new nuclear in the molten salt micro reactors where it's incredible that they can produce up to 12 megawatts of electricity. Uh, and I know most people hearing that they don't understand what, what does that mean? What is 12 megawatts? Well, 12 megawatt, the average uh, household uses about a thousand kilowatt hours in, in a month. So 12 mm -hmm. megawatts is at least 1,200 homes powering. Wow. And these micro reactors, molten salt micro reactors can produce up to 12 megawatts in one 40 foot shipping container. Wow, really? One 40 foot shipping container could power anywhere from 10 to 20,000 homes. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, so let's, let's dive into that. Um, how, how can somebody uh, acquire one of these <laughs> if money wasn't an option, let's just say if money wasn't an option and, uh, you know, and you had the will and the know-how, uh, which it sounds like you do. Um, like how, how does, yeah. How, how does this, how does this work? Well, uh, unfortunately acquire is, is not the best term because you can't, you can't acquire one. Um, obviously nuclear regulatory commission is, keeps a tight lid on who can and cannot own and operate a nuclear reactor for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what's, what's happening with the, this new nuclear is they're looking at creating a 
manufacturing plant, that manufacturing plant that's going to produce all of these nuclear reactors inside of the, the that are contained in the shipping containers, they're going to produce them there in one site. That one site obtains the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's license to be able to operate. And then that one company that builds them also has to own and operate them. So they might be able to ship them, move them anywhere, but they still own the asset, they operate it, and all they do is sell you the power. That is So just like you pay your electric bill, it's the same thing. It's, it, it's just going at a much larger scale. Okay. So Bitcoin, if they, you said it was 12 megawatts of power, what, what is that looking looking like as far as, uh, you know, let's just go with today's numbers, 37K or whatever you want to call it, 38. Um, it's about 12 containers, 12 containers of Bitcoin miners. Each container or each megawatt is about 300 plus Bitcoin miners at the current rate. I don't even know what hash rate is that now. I forgot. It's a, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. So what are, what, are, what are you looking at? Just like ballpark average per month for, for an operation like this as far as Bitcoin? Looking at what? You know, Bitcoin produced. Bitcoin produced? Oh, yeah. God. I don't even have numbers on that card. And it changes from, you know, day to day with the hash rate. So Give me an average. Oh, geez. Okay. Instead of, instead of thinking of it like that, let's just look at it. Just if you were able to, you said not acquire, but uh, it sounds like it's going to be more of a lease of a sort uh, than anything. Uh, I don't know how they, how this company does their, uh, their contracts, but, um, let's say you do have one of these and you are able to hook up all these miners. Like how much Bitcoin are we talking? It's, it's a lot. I mean, you're talking about if you, if you used all 12 megawatt, megawatts of the power for Bitcoin mining, you're talking 12 containers. You're talking, that's what 300 each. That's 36 or three, 3,600, uh, S19. If you'd use the XPs, that's a lot. Of, I mean, that's a lot of Terra hash you're talking about. Give me just ballpark. It's a lot of math, man. You ask me to do it on the spot. I don't know. <laughs> just, give me, just give me a ballpark. It doesn't have to be the right number. Uh, you ask me a question, then I usually rely on Excel spreadsheets. To uh, are you? Are, <laughs> yeah. Like, are, are we? Are we talking to like thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds? Yeah. Of Bitcoin. What are we talking about? Yeah, you're talking. You're talking. Tens. Yeah, you're talking tens and, and tens and hundreds per month, per on, year, per month. Oh wow, yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. Okay, that's that's the kind of ballpark I want. Yeah, just, I mean, it's easier to talk about it in terms of of electricity power produced. Um, okay. So if you're doing 12 megawatts, it's uh, if you're buying the electricity, say, okay. So back to your question, or you had a question about the contract. How does how does this work? Well, yeah. I have a partnership with one of these uh, micro reactor designers. Their company's called Alpha Tech Resource Corporation. Okay. Out of BYU, some brilliant genius people that are about five years away from being able to produce these things. And I have an agreement with them to be able to purchase a hundred percent of the power that's produced by one of these reactors. And then I can actually turn around and resell some of the power as well. Um, it gets a little bit back into the origin story of how I got here, but, uh, so yeah, we can, we can talk about that. Yeah. Let's talk about that if you want to. Yeah. Well, you know, it's fun. It's It goes back to ABC, um, Austin Bitcoin club for those uninitiated. Uh, the, uh, so back when Atwood took over, uh, Austin Bitcoin club, Michael Atwood, the first panel that he did was a mining panel and he asked me to be on it and I was on it. And we also got, uh, we got Parker Lewis to moderate it and Mitch, uh, who had, I think recently uh, resigned from compass at the time and, or maybe shortly thereafter, I can't remember the timing, but also we got Chad Harris from- uh, Oh, Win Giga Chad. Yeah, Giga Chad, yeah. Winstone, Riot, uh, actually, yeah, he was- Dude, his founder story is amazing. It is. God, dude, I need to get him on the pod, man. <laughs> yes, I, you should. Yeah, I need to get him one of these days. I'll just drive over there and- uh, Oh, he's extremely yeah. welcoming too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and he's very yeah, yeah I, met him, I met him a couple of times. Yeah, yeah, he's a great guy. So I'm sitting there on this panel and and- getting a few of my talking points in, but I'm listening to Giga Chad and Parker go back and forth on the value that Bitcoin mining brings the grid and brings the, our country and our, for our energy demands. And it, it hit me that like this demand response that they're getting paid for and demand response is basically saying, I will shut my miners off whenever the power demand is so high 
like winter storm Uri or in the middle of the summer, summer when everybody's ACs are on, that the power price goes through the roof and I will sell my power credits back and not use my power for that time period. And I'll just turn my miners off because I, I make more money then off of selling that back into the market. But it also performs a service to the community of making sure that there is more than enough power at standby, at ready. Yeah, they, I think I believe they did that during the summer this this year. When we got up to 115 here right. in like June or whatever it was, June, July. Yeah. And they, they did that as well, which helped the grid. Yes, exactly. They're helping the grid. They're, they are, I mean, in, quite frankly, they're saving lives. Uh, 100%. Doing, doing things like that, keeping the AC on, keeping the elderly in good climate. Um, I've got parents these days and then in, in, uh, in-laws, and I, I care about the, you know, worry about these things a little bit, making sure that they're, uh, make, making sure that they're in a good state. And, and, or you got hospitals that need to make sure that they have continuous power. You got all these different things that people are, their lives are dependent on continuous power. And for people that don't know, like Rockdale is a destination now, as far as like a place here in, um, in Texas, like it, uh, and it's because of the work that they've done, uh, around, around Bitcoin mining and, um, really taking in, uh, with open arms, that town and, um, yeah. calling it their own and taking care of that community over there. It's, yeah. it's beautiful to see, man. It really is like, yeah. it's, it's a heartwarming story. Like it, it's, it's, it's quite, yeah, it's uh, and it's a testimony to the economic development that can happen from Bitcoin. absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm sitting on this panel, Parker and and Giga Chat are talking back and forth, and it just kind of hits me the value that Bitcoin mining really brings. I, I knew some of this, but for some reason, it just I, I literally had an epiphany moment where I sat there and, and turned and just was listening to them, and and I realized that the value of Bitcoin mining is on the top side and the bottom. And so I got started, I was talking to, when I first introduced, was introduced to Alpha Tech Resource, the nuclear company, micro reactors. Um, I was asking them, well, I'm guessing you guys have a minimum operating level that you have to maintain to keep the reactor going. And they said, yeah, absolutely. It has to operate at a minimum of two megawatts. Oh, wow. So I'm like, so I'm guessing that it's probably painful or difficult to wind those reactors down and then be able to turn them back. And I didn't, I didn't, at the time, at the time I'm having this conversation, I'm, I'm an idiot about this information. And so I'm, I, it, but I was asking the right questions and they say, yeah, it's really painful. It's, and so, so having a continuous demand for at least two megawatts of power 24 um, seven would be a big value to you then. Well, yeah, it would. Yeah, it'd be very valuable to us. Okay, well, I think that I might have the perfect solution for you. <laughs> is put a couple containers, two or three containers, two to three megawatts of Bitcoin mining on there, and then we ensure that these nuclear reactors run 24-7 and that they will never fall below that minimum operating level. So that's it brings another, by partnering Bitcoin with nuclear, um, not only am I securing cost-efficient, reliable power for the Bitcoin mining, but I'm actually making a more stable solution to be able to provide to hospitals, manufacturers, even oil refineries, uh, different thing, different operations that need to make sure that they have reliable power at a cost-effective industrial rate. Yeah. So do you think, do you think it's possible for this to happen? You said here in the next two to five, what, what, what are we, cause like, I guess they're still currently trying to, trying to make this and we can dive into like regulations and all that stuff afterwards. But like, how, like what are they, like, what's, what's the final step to all this as far as yeah. like getting it out there? Yeah. This is the challenging part is the regulatory. Uh, so these new nuclear technologies, the reg, all of the regulations have been written for old nuclear. So this is a little bit wild west, a little bit new frontier and like how, how do we, how do we make sure that we're, the regulations fit what this new technology is? Like, how do you get it out of the lab, basically? Right? Yeah, how, do you, how, how do you not even get it out of the lab? How do you get it off of the computer simulations and then actually build the lab to test it? You got to get approval just to build the test reactor. Mm -hmm. And there's significant breakthroughs that, breakthroughs that just happened a couple weeks ago 
Uh, the first molten salt reactor got approved to be able to be uh, put in to be able to build a test reactor out of uh, out of California. I believe it's um, as Kairos Power. They got their approval, and so from basically the entire process is estimated to be somewhere around four to five years. So from the moment that you put your first application in with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to the time that you actually get approved and all of the intermediate steps and milestones in between, which they are many, there are many. Yeah, sounds like it's, yeah. Yeah, which is good. Um, but all of that takes about four and a half to five years. And we saw even more re- uh, prior to that approval, there's a company called New Scale, um, and they were using actually older technology they were still using control or rods and control rods solid solid uranium but they were making small smr small modular reactors as just basically they're like 200 and 200, 200 to 250 megawatts and they can be built in pieces at a factory and, and assembled on on site instead of having to build everything in one location in a, in a huge construction project um which is the difference between smrs and traditional models um, but that one got, that was the first new nuclear reactor design approved in decades. I don't know exactly, I can't remember exactly how long, but it's been decades. And that happened this past January. And that was huge. It was a huge signal to the market that, okay, the regulatory fl- framework is open to new nuclear. And we're open to working with new nuclear to make sure that the that we are testing these things properly and we're working to a future where we meet the power demands and include new nuclear in that okay yeah it sounds uh sound like it's going to take some time yeah uh it sounds like it's it'll probably be well worth it when it does um get to a point of production or at least out of the lab as they say um what um, what are you working on right now? Uh, just because, like I said, let's go let's go back to Line Shield because yeah. that's the that's the company that you started and been pouring a lot of time and attention. I know we've talked about it here at the lab many times over many conversations. You know whether you know it's like after Bit Devs or after ABC or just you know, yeah you know just whenever we're hanging out. Like, but what what is like your plan? Uh, go to market strategy. Like you know. And then also, what have you been working on to, to kind of prepare for this? So it, it's like I mentioned earlier. So Lion Shield, the whole point is we've got this partnership with Alpha Tech. We've put the Bitcoin mining together with the microreactors to be able to provide this solution. And we're calling it the Sure Power solution because it's reliable. It's sure. You can secure your energy future. And we're taking that concept and we have the ability to go out and sign power purchase agreements with industrial power purchasers. So again, like your manufacturing, your hospital campus, your university campus, your refineries, all of these different use cases that are, are pulling a lot of power. Um, and they are in need of a continue, continuous reliable source of, of power. And then we're offering them something that's a clean form of power and also very, very cost efficient on that industrial basis. So it's, uh, we have like, what we're doing right now is getting as much presence out there so people are educated. Um, So a couple studies that I've looked at, marketing studies, one goes back to Block. uh, Mm -hmm. And originally Block put out a, a study around Bitcoin. So taking this back to Bitcoin again is... They, it was a, maybe six months ago they put out a study and there was a lot of different um, statistics, a lot of different graphs and everything. But the one that stood out the most to me was the correlation between education and adoption. Mm-hmm. And it was so tightly correlated that the more somebody was educated, the more not, not only the more likely somebody was at adopting Bitcoin, they were already buying or they were intending on buying for the first time because the, the higher level of knowledge that they had about it. Mm-hmm. So I look at that as it, that's pervasive across anything. The more knowledge you have about something, if it's a good thing, um, you're going to adopt it. Uh, so right now, uh, I just recently read a marketing study on nuclear as well and saw the exact same correlation from that marketing study. That's a marketing study put out by a Potential Energy Coalition, um, 
know if I mentioned it before, but it was uh, recently on a Nuclear Energy Institute podcast and a great study. Uh, and so one of the one of the main things is, is the more somebody is educated about this, the more likely they are to be for new nuclear and for advanced nuclear technologies to to solve our energy demand problems. So what I'm doing is as much as I can is getting, um, gathering as much research and trying to take that tech, technical research and synthesizing it down into something that the average person can understand with a little bit of effort. Doing my best at that's not easy when you're talking about <laughs> nuclear science and engineering. Um, but trying to communicate that and put it into blog posts, sharing it with LinkedIn, sharing it with Twitter, getting the information out there so that people can understand and be ready for the future. Um, so, again, just increasing that uh, adoption curve through education. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that sounds that sounds like the right thing to do right now. Are you, uh, have you already, you know, created a corporation or what, what, are, what are you operating right now? Or is it still kind of like a, just like an LLC? Like, what are we, are you deploying any, any kind of uh, capital of your own into it? Like, I'm sure you had to get something to get that contract in place. I would imagine. You know, we have, and an you don't have to, you know, you can share whatever you want. You don't have to share everything. I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm just asking the questions people are going to want to know. Yeah. We have an entity already in place. Uh, right now this is completely self-funded. Okay. Um, so all of this is based on relationships that I've made over the years. Um, so some of my background is I was in the oil and gas industry, the energy industry for many years. So I am buying and selling crude oil, blending it, building uh, crude oil blending plants, selling so that. this is not your first energy, energy <laughs> road here. <laughs> Guess not. Yeah. yeah, definitely cut my teeth and uh, had plenty of failures and, and successes in that in, in prior in prior lives. Yeah. But uh, so, but made many relationships and good relationships that have been able to tap back into, and um, and some of those people really understand the the benefits, and it, and I think that really hits home is that there's not a fight between, there's really not a fight between nuclear and fossil fuels, um, and especially when you talk to people in the oil and gas industry, they get it. They they get that having reliable power can help their operations. And that's been some conversations that I'd be able to hit home with some refineries um, that are very receptive to the idea of powering their refinery uh, to be able to have a low cost electricity to be able to power their refinery and continue creating um, crude oil products. And also having interconnects that can power the grid and power arrangements already uh, to be able to sell power directly into power homes in, in entire communities. And so in the same regard, I'm basically working to be able to power not only refineries, but also entire communities through those relationships that I've made in past lives. Yeah. I mean, it, it makes sense. I mean, because at the end of the day, they can coexist, right? I mean, there's so many different use cases for fossil fuels and, and we're not moving away from it anytime no, soon. No. <laughs> I doubt we ever will as a civilization. Uh, you know, these nuggets are going to be there forever. So it's, uh, it's something that's always going to, you know, appear in our world. Uh, and uh, it sounds like nuclear is uh, just another approach to uh, facilitating maybe the energy portion of it. Yeah. And who I, knows? You know, and a lot of, a lot of publicity has gone to renewables over the past couple decades, and understandably so. People are wanting new solutions um, to be able to get away from fossil fossil fuels for a myriad of reasons. Um, but what they found, or if you look at the actual numbers, the more renewables that we put on the grid, it doesn't actually change the amount of fossil fuels that we're using. It, you know, there might be a higher percentage of energy that's or gen, electricity that's generated by renewables these days. Yeah. I would imagine they would just allocate somewhere else, right? Like the growth in yeah. energy, the growth in energy demand and demand for electricity has grown so much at that same time that it's not actually reducing the amount of fossil yeah. fuels that we're burning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's, that's one thing that I always like, I always scratch my head at when, when these pundits would come up there and be like, Oh, you know, we need this in the greenhouse gases and the, you know, whatever they would say about the, like all these fossil fuels and you can, I'm just like, but wait a second. Like if we're constantly 
iterating and we're constantly growing in society and making these big steps. Like and I'm, I'm more left side of the bell curve, right? Like I'm like, wait a second, isn't this, isn't this, uh, isn't it going to require even more resources? <laughs> like, shouldn't we, shouldn't we be grabbing anything and everything that we think is a remote possibility of adding to this, uh, to this pile? I don't know. Like, yeah. To me, to me, that just seems plain, plainfully obvious. Well, and this, it's not like this is new news. Yeah. They've understood the efficiency of power generation of nuclear for since the 1960s. So yeah. The actual the molten salt reactor was designed in the 1960s. It was called the molten salt reactor experiment. It was out of uh, Oak Valley uh, National Laboratory, and it was really interesting. It came out of the the concept to be able to create a nuclear powered. Um, a jet or really yeah yeah that sounds fun yeah it's so an <laughs> aircraft that's the word i was trying to look for yeah nu- nuclear powered aircraft uh-uh. and i don't i still look at the logistics of that of how how does that work ramping like you land and then you have to shut down the react i don't i don't get it um but that's that was where it came from and then, like i said these things are using what's equivalent to a jet engine to be able to power the electricity well, that same heat that's coming off the nuclear nuclear reactor can turn a turbine, and it can, just like a jet engine, well, then it can use to be able to move a plane forward. Um, so that was how it came be it came to be. But what they found out was, while this the experiment was wildly successful, it also uh, there was we were in the middle of the Cold War, and mm-hmm. so there was a big drive to be able to make more nuclear weapons and more powerful nuclear weapons. And so they wanted to explore and all their budget, uh, this government, the government budget went away from the molten salt reactor experiment into research into plutonium to make more powerful weapons. Mm -hmm. And one of the, one of the, (laughs) all of the light water reactors and the type of uranium that they use, uh, one of the byproducts of these light water reactors is plutonium. So, Basically, all of these nuclear power plants are little um, enrichment plants to help make nuclear weapons. But if you have a molten salt reactor that makes less waste, which it does, mm-hmm. it's not making more plutonium for, for weapons. So back it was all politics and defense strategies back then is, well, it doesn't make any sense to put budget towards something that's not going to get us bigger and better weapons in the Cold War. Yeah. That was a crazy time back then. Yeah. I mean, it feels like we're headed back towards that. But I mean, wait and see. That's a whole other podcast. Yeah, that's a whole other podcast. <laughs> uh, so nuclear. It, it so it sounds like we're there. Sounds like there's something there that could possibly lead to you know Bitcoin generation. Is there any other uh, obvious ways or current ways now? Because doesn't Texas have its own nuclear plant here in San Antonio or something like that? Uh, or has that been shut down? I'm not sure. I don't follow this nope, stuff. It hasn't been shut down. There's definitely an operating nuclear power plant. Uh, so one uh, company, Bitcoin mining company, worked with a nuclear power plant up in Pennsylvania to be the first uh, nuclear-powered Bitcoin mining operation. And they are behind the meter, as they say. So they're operating right next to the nuclear plant, taking the power, and they're being basically that, that base load uh, for the nuclear power plant, as I'm talking about more on a micro scale. So yes, there are other ways. Um, there's, I'm focused in on these micro reactors that are anywhere from one to 12 megawatts and being more, creating a more decentralized, not only decentralized Bitcoin mining, but decentralizing the power generation, spreading it out, um, taking the ethos of Bitcoin and the de- decentralization to be in spreading it to power generation as well. However, if you wanted to take a different market segment and go after the 800 megawatt, one gigawatt nuclear power plants that they're creating, somebody wanted to build and raise the capital to build the large uh, Bitcoin mines to be able to help support that, they could take a similar model or even these SMRs that are more like 200, 250 Megawatts, yeah. Somebody could definitely do that. It takes a lot more capital, though. Yeah, absolutely. So, it, so I guess the way I'm imagining it in my head, and tell me if I'm wrong, we would take one of these micro nuclear reactors, place it somewhere, or would this? You said that it would be more of a farm, or like, how would you get access to it to um, to start attaching um, these 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 hash huts? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, basically, they're 
I'm trying to get it. I'm trying to get an image in my head of what that looks like. Well, and, the, and it's okay. I mean, we're yeah. four sounds like we're two to five years away, but like, I just want to know what. Well, what the reactor looks. in general, I mean, just imagine a shipping container okay. and you get a whole bunch of power coming out of a shipping container, just a giant generator. Okay. And you, because it's a shipping container, it can be transported by truck or transported by ship anywhere in the world, any location. So that's where I'm saying, like, yeah. where, what location? Because currently, right now, I, I wouldn't imagine like you can put the, you can park this in your backyard or your front. Like, obviously, you couldn't do that. But like, where, where would you possibly park this thing um, that would also meet the, the guidelines and uh, regulations and, and other red tape? That's uh, that's probably um, necessary. I mean, it's it's no different than any other power generation is all we all have the regulated regulations that you have to follow and get approval by the, the whoever the local authorities are so we're looking at not only locations inside the u.s but also outside of the u.s in fact okay locations outside of the u.s are probably easier to um the arrangements are easier to get done okay faster than inside the u.s okay so it's, it's not something that we'll see you know up here in uh in Granger or something. <laughs> Definitely not going to say, I, I, I mean, maybe one day I can't say, never say never. <laughs> no, I know what you're saying. Yeah. So you're saying it, it yeah, it sounds like it, it would be uh, somewhere remote or, or somewhere out of country or. It doesn't have to be, but yeah. that's where I'm targeting because that's where the biggest need is. And I mean, so to give you an example, there's different islands, whether they're Caribbean islands or Hawaii that pay upwards of 30 to 40 cents per kilowatt hour for their retail electric rate. Oh, okay. And so average person here in the U.S. pays uh, around 15, 16 cents, I think it is. And then here in Texas, I think it's more like 12 cents a kilowatt hour. So these guys at the islands are paying three, four, and sometimes even five times as much as uh, what we're paying for our retail electric bill. And so what that means is like, you got to go to a lot of these Caribbean islands that are paying things like that. They don't, they don't have air conditioning. Yeah. I mean, they live in a Caribbean island. Maybe they just don't need it, but they don't have it uh, and they can't afford it. Uh, and so there, if you can go and provide lower cost, reliable power to them, then they all of a sudden have this boon to their economy, economic development, because they've got, they're now on a level playing field with somebody that's, in the middle of Texas. Right. Gosh, man, you went really deep on this. I was, uh, I was, uh, yeah, I feel like you satisfied a lot of the questions that I had around it. Um, where, where can people, uh, learn more if they wanted to reach out to you? Where can they go to, uh, to do that? Uh, so a couple different places to reach out to me. The best place to learn more is my website, uh, lionshieldcap.com. That's like capital C A P. And if the best way to reach out to me directly is either through LinkedIn, uh, my profile there, just under Michael Schultz, and or on Twitter, uh, we have at LionShieldBTC. Cool. Yeah, dude, I appreciate you uh, coming on and, and talking nuclear. Um, I learned something today. I'm sure the people at home learned something. And uh, yeah, man, we'll just to see what you uh, go out there and do. Uh, just... Uh, you know, if you, if you do get it on an island or something, just, uh, you know, don't forget about car and <laughs> invite them over to come uh, hang on your island. <laughs> Definitely will. <laughs> Maybe get some like uh, margaritas or something on the beach. Just a few. Just a few. <laughs> um, but um, you should watch that show. It's actually a pretty good show. It's uh, with Kurt Russell. It's like, uh, uh, I, think it's, I think it's like, monsters or something but it's good dude there's like flashbacks to the jungle and then there's flash forwards and it's kurt russell man the guy's like you know it's kurt russell and uh it's a good show oh actually his son is in it too okay so his son plays him at a younger age and then he plays kurt russell at an older age like it's kind of okay. cool it's like anyway I've, I've been watching it and uh i saw over it over the holiday or you know thanksgiving weekend or whatever yeah, I, I was just like blown away. And plus, it's nuclear stuff. You'll love it. I I still think you're right on though. We've got to figure out how to solve the Godzilla problem. We got to figure out the Godzilla problem. If we can't it's, do that. We're not the going elephant anywhere. in the room that no one wants to talk about. It's literally like the you know the 150 foot dinosaur in the room. Mm -hmm.